cities and world cities, um, world's largest cities as you'll see on here. Um, as I'm sure you'll probably notice, there, there are many that are spread throughout the world. Right? Lots, of, lots of cities and mega cities. Um, start of this chapter talks about thinking about uh, well, if the two million years of humankind was spent in a twenty-four hour day, let's say you know settlements show up uh, with just more than hundred people, settlements of that size emerged almost at the end of the day, right? Actual towns and cities, all these things are very recent developments, and we're all still trying to figure out as a species. Um, what we want from cities, are these natural things, are these unnatural, how do we feel about cities? In general, uh, you know, a lot of people who move to cities, it's not a choice, they're doing it uh, often if they've been dispossessed of where they have been staying. Um, there's been a big effort in different periods of time to uh, take away the ability of people to use land uh, that had been for generations part of their normal area of just as hunting gathering people um, well if you Let's say you have a, a place and you want people to work for a wage uh, But no one wants those jobs well if you dispossess people of a whole bunch of their land and their uh, ability to sustain themselves They will move to a city and then they will look for waged labor to sustain themselves and it's been a way of uh, a lot of places around the world have transitioned populations uh, often unwillingly into um, just being being working class. Um, percent of, of world urbanization as well as the number of people moving to cities as you can see is pretty um, pretty constant in this has not slowed down. There's been, it's been in the news a lot, of course, because uh, a lot of people have moved out of central cities because a lot of the things that people, if they choose to live in a central city, um, they choose it for uh, the interactions that they do, uh, the amenities. And during the pandemic, a lot of people, there's been a great talk about the reversal of urbanization. Um, I would say, it may end up being a bit of a blip on these charts in the future when there'll be a little bit of a of a of a thing in 2020 and they'll be like oh things slowed down a bit um but i think i don't think it's a long-term phenomenon people said a very similar thing about cities when the suburbs all kind of arose people uh were predicting the end of central cities and sure enough there was a period of time as i said during deindustrialization when uh people were moving out to the suburbs moving out of the central cities um but since there has been a uh, especially in the late um 90s uh but especially in the two early 2000s there's been a move uh back to central cities mostly because uh well gentrification which we've talked about somewhat uh but the the abandonment of different areas within central cities created an investment opportunity for people later to just get pieces of property that are very central, uh, but get them very cheap. Um, and sometimes they would bulldoze and build on top of it. Sometimes they would rehabilitate, especially if it was some older buildings. Um, when it was or shown the video of the guy doing urban explorations, uh, I used to do that kind of thing to places that, that I can't get into now. Uh, like the, uh, the Minneapolis uh, big train depot that's down downtown that is now like a big skating rink and stuff that was abandoned for years and years and years and it was not difficult to get inside of these buildings uh, some of these buildings would just be huge um, but they were in need of, of they weren't safe safe for people to be in so <clears throat> urbanized population of the world uh, you might notice that this does not align perfectly with a population map. Um, there's plenty of places that uh, have big populations, but still have a large percentage of their space are rural. I would say India is a, a pretty classic example of that. Uh, big populations, but uh, the definition of what is urban changes from place to place. 
right? Uh, so as you can see in India, a place would have to have twice as many people uh, per square mile or per square meter, depending on how it's measured, uh, compared to a place like South Africa, which could have a, a lot smaller population density and still considered urban. Part of the reason for that is because South Africa is still very rural uh, compared to most other countries with a similar level of development. <clears throat> um, we talked about some of this stuff when we talked about uh, our chapter on agriculture, uh, but that seems to be one of the main first steps to allow for cities to happen. Um, having an agricultural surplus. Uh, before that, uh, hunting and gathering, right? So everybody basically had to work on getting food and getting uh, supplies and materials. There wasn't uh, a surplus. Once there's a surplus, well, then you have people who can do other things. Uh, when it talks about in the book, social stratification, the division of labor, uh, you know, that social stratification, uh, you know, stratification, you might, if you study geology, you'll think of rocks and how they're in these layers. And stratification usually means you don't change what level you're in. Uh, and so if you look at ancient civilizations, uh, there was a real strict hierarchy to people's position in society uh, and what their life outcomes would be was largely determined at birth. Um, well, these things, and I know we're talking about because of the agricultural surplus. I think we also talked a little bit about some of the first countries that had some of what we would call cities. Um, I've been reading up on a lot of the digs in these areas, and a lot of the cities would only last for a couple of years, or sometimes they'd only be used part of the year. Uh, it's one of those things where uh, it's difficult to determine exactly at what point a place becomes a, you can put a check mark by it and it's like, it's a city now. A um, couple of different things. Uh, cosmo-magical cities, right? If places were cosmo-magical, what does that mean? Well, the, when we studied religions around the world, we know that obviously there's all kinds of religions. If you study ancient cities and ancient civilizations, they had like, each city would have its own gods very, very commonly. This is back when there was, you know, uh, wasn't monotheism in the day. Uh, it was almost like, you know how like each city kind of has its own sports teams and its own kind of motto and stuff. And it's like, that's how the ancient world was about religions. And each little city uh, really felt that theirs was su the superior uh, supreme being compared to others. And it wasn't until much later, usually when, when empires happen, that well, when empires take over areas, they make everyone convert to their religion. That's when religions started kind of homogenizing through different areas. Um, well, setting up a central religious uh, figure, temple, uh, mascot, whatever you want to call it, uh, that's kind of part of the uh, oldest cities, and that was one of the things that would define them as we can now call this a city, that there's enough of a division of labor that we can have people making great big buildings that are, you know, designed and pretty. Um, also having cities specifically oriented north, south, east, west, um, why that took an amount of planning, an amount of, of design, uh, which again takes a, a larger division of labor than you would have during hunting and gathering societies. <clears throat> Um, and historically, we paint a lot of these different uh, empires or whatnot as these great big entities, but uh, kingdoms like Egypt, uh, sometimes the Egyptian empire would have gigantic amounts of space, including most of the Nile, but other times you would have different kingdoms that would revolt and go their own way, and then sometimes they'd be re-merged again, and it was just more of a, a fluid process, these different empires and different city-states. Uh, but that's why they call them city-states. Uh, very often, as I said, you'd have a culture that would have one central city was kind of the, the basis of power and control. Um, 
but their their area would not go that far to reach another major city. I think I might have shown these pictures of uh, Egypt already, but Egypt being the classic example of one of the first places that had a great agricultural surplus. Um, also the control of the hydrology, the water resources. Um, many of the classic city things that we talk about, uh, we find first in uh, Egypt and Mesopotamia. <clears throat> um, this is just, uh, our book talked about the, the north, south, east, west design of uh, a lot of different central cities. Um, not always the case, but very often the case. You see some areas labeled here as, as suburbs. Uh, I'm, this is just a reminder that the suburb, you know, it used to be, uh, that was a bad term, right? Sub, <coughs> meaning lower than. And so the suburbs in the early days and the early definitions of the terms were the areas people did not want to live. Very often it would be outside of the protective wall barriers. Uh, they'd be the people who'd be vulnerable anytime there'd be an attack from a neighboring empire. And there usually was an, a, an attack by a neighboring empire. It's kind of always happening. Again, central religious structure and figure. <clears throat> um, so these are the six main uh, urban core regions of the world. Uh, and again, this is, this is a little murky because as you can see, there's, there's thousands of years that separate the time frame for a couple of them. And so the question of um, the diffusion of the idea of city, of the technology of cities, uh, you know, do we know categorically that the Nile got their ideas from Mesopotamia? Well, it would make sense. It was more than a thousand years before it and uh, relatively close. Um, uh, so those local city-states, um, you know, historically they would be a center of an empire. Uh, this is the day when like most places were empires. Uh, just geographically, uh, if you study history and pick any part of the world, uh, if you go back in time, it was a whole bunch of city-states that each had their own little empires and they all would be attempting to take over other areas. Um, they would have a core and periphery, a periphery where they would gather resources for their core. Um, and the core is where you would have uh, merchants and artisans and all kinds of different things. Diffusion of urban life. Um, so again, the idea of cities, very often lots of places, uh, well, if, if, if you're in a city that didn't have a, a, a strong empire within it, well, it's likely you would have been invaded, um, people kidnapped and sold into slavery. This happened like all over the world. And so it would be your interest to actually, uh, try to create a city with a big, large wall and build up a force of people who could fight uh, and do these types of things. And so because places were played off against each other, we have the rise of, of city-states and the rise of the systems that happen within the city-states. Uh, so for example, you could have, you know, as we know, ancient, uh, ancient Egypt had a, a, a slave-based economy, right? Um, well, the ancient Greeks learned that way of, of how cities should go uh, and the division of labor. Uh, and then the Romans, the Romans after them learned from the Greeks. Uh, Spain learned from the Romans. And so uh, each country, through its turn, took on these same types of things that were going on in cities. Division of labor, how cities were laid out. Uh, again, you can see geographically the different areas of the world and how quickly they're urbanizing. Um, <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, 
There's a number of things, that, of course, we have still today from these ancient cities, uh, the examples of Roman cities, uh, mostly because, well, Rome was really known for its roads, for its transportation. Uh, you know the phrase, all roads lead to Rome. Um, Rome was the big empire where, where transportation, uh, because it wasn't just one city, I mean, it was, it was Rome, uh, but it took over such a large territory that included other cities. Uh, it would need good transportation between these places because it was one of the first times that you had big uh, nodes of power throughout the empire that were in more than one place. Although, as I say, of course, Rome, the city itself, was the central uh, place of the empire. Um, it was one of the first kind of expansions of these things. <clears throat> uh, and many of the cities that were uh, developed and designed during the Roman period, um, you know, the streets are still laid out on that classic grid system. And it's a system that works so well that, you know, modern cities tend to put those in. Um, I would say, you know, if you get lost driving, usually it's because you're in a place where they don't have a grid system. Uh, things like, uh, actually, that's one of the changeovers of modern suburbs in the US as they specifically did not want to have the suburbs to have a, a grid system. They wanted um, things like cul-de-sacs where, you know, if you live in a cul-de-sac, if someone drives into your cul-de-sac, you're kind of aware of it immediately because the only people who drive into the cul-de-sac are people who live there. And so if someone is just driving around, you're kind of like suspicious, right? It's like, why are they driving over here? Uh, whereas on a grid system, there are people coming in and going all the time because everything is, is a bypass to go somewhere or the other. Uh, and so that makes it so that, well, the suburbs are going for an effort of, of exclusivity. Uh, and well, originally they were called bedroom suburbs uh, because they were meant just for people to sleep. So they wanted it to be quiet, not a lot else going on in the original suburbs in the U.S. Um, so we talk about urban revolutions. Um, there are two main urban revolutions uh, because obviously, um, well, the first one created a lot of ur urbanization, but the second urban revolution, that is the, the one that is still causing urbanization today, right? Um, people going to cities for jobs, as we just saw. <clears throat> um, all right, a whole bunch of points uh, from this part of the chapter. Let me see, is there a way I could summarize all this easily? Uh, well, the second urban revolution um, involved a lot of, uh, as you could say, as you could see, this talks about capitalism, right? Capitalism really forming the structure of our cities uh, and our societies through time uh, as, as society switched over. Uh, classically, uh, societies have gone through a number of different phases of development uh, of their economies and their division of labor. Uh, before wide-scale capitalism, uh, the main kind of division of labor was feudalism, right? Where you would have uh, warrior kings and you would have uh, a, a landed arist aristocracy who would, who would rule and have control of land. And then you would have people who were serfs, uh, and these were not people who were slaves, but they didn't have like human rights or anything like that. Uh, and there, they were there to work the land and to give part of their surplus to the rulers, right? Um, and that seemed like a terrible, terrible system, but of course the system before that was slavery. That was one of the main ways that agriculture was done was through forced labor. Uh, slavery used to be a, a much wider thing um, uh, with lots of different definitions, uh, especially in different countries. So, uh, for example, when we talk about agriculture, when we're talking about like ancient Rome or Greece, uh, you know, when they would invade countries, they would just, uh, any soldiers that surrendered, uh, they would enslave and those would become the new agricultural workers. Uh, sometimes countries would specifically just do raids in the neighboring countries just to get a uh, slave workforce, uh, to get people to do lots of jobs that, that they didn't want to do themselves. 
Um, so let's see, what else have we got in here? Um, yeah, urban land becoming very, very valuable, and that's part of the reason why we talk, talked about how land was divided through time. Um, residential areas separated from work areas. Uh, classically, uh, people would do the work that they would do in their home and the whole family would do it. And this is a, a similar way to how kind of caste systems evolved. Um, so, you know, let's say uh, you're born into a household of people who uh, were shoemakers, right? And you would learn that craft as you grew up and other members of your family would and you would likely, that would be your name, the shoemakers. Um, well, that, that changed with cities uh, and all those different kinds of uh, connections between people, the stratified layers uh, in cities got broken up a bit because you have a whole bunch of people moving to cities and uh, those specific kind of job roles aren't really there as much anymore. People get whatever job they can get. Uh, all right, that's a lot for one, one page note. Uh, so the Twin Cities, uh, this is an early picture of St. Anthony Falls, 1855. Um, Twin Cities here is a classic example of um, the things that make cities tick, uh, access to water, um, and it was navigable water, so you could have transportation up and down the Mississippi to this area. Um, early cities, uh, where they were in connection to trade routes was, was very important, and it still is today. Uh, you know, this is one of the reasons why a lot of small cities in the U.S. are in decline um, that really started coming about when the, the age of uh, train transportation uh, was overtaken by automobile. Um, and a lot of early cities that were on train routes, if they were not on road routes later, those cities just, just kind of vanished because there was no economic uh, input there anymore. Um, so much of examples, as I said, of kind of classical cities and where they're situ situated. Um, portage site, if you haven't been to Grand Portage up north. Uh, Right, so because water is, of course, a source of, of so much, you need to drink it, you need it for industrial processes, it could be used for transportation. Uh, older cities especially, uh, the road was less important, but through time it's become more and more important. Uh, again, another picture of St. Anthony Falls. Um, you know, a reminder because it's along a transportation route, a lot of migration come up along the river. <clears throat> um, there's also, of course, in the U.S., a, a transition through time from horses and things like stagecoaches uh, to motor vehicles. Uh, the book also uses the term streetcar suburbs, streetcar suburbs. Um, those were the first suburbs that happened uh, in the U.S. Uh, were, were streetcars that became relatively inexpensive ways for people to travel, and it really got people just kind of moving around their city. Uh, people would ride them just to kind of explore, uh, and those again was the, f the first suburbs were very near central cities, and a lot of the neighborhoods uh, that that uh, are today within cities. So this being in Minneapolis, I'll use some Minneapolis examples of, uh, well, no, like a St. Paul example, like Frogtown. People probably know Frogtown as a neighborhood. Um, well, Frogtown was originally its own suburb of downtown St. Paul, uh, but St. Paul, as these different areas grew in populations, uh, they would annex it uh, to get that their that tax base, basically. So the central cities in the U.S. grew through time uh, with early 
uh, commuting. Uh, Minneapolis, 1862, you can see not the, not the densest of development. 1903, um, this is after we're fully industrialized. Um, this train here was actually originally a, a commuter train uh, over to the area uh, Dinky Town, Dinky Town, which used to not be part of Minneapolis, used to be its own little suburb that people commuted to, um, but now it was, you know, part of Minneapolis. Uh, I think I'm going to show you guys some of these pictures already. The early shanty towns in the Twin Cities, um, similar other places around the world that have shanty towns, places that Poor people moving from rural areas looking for work and they gotta live somewhere and so they put together housing on land that they don't own. Uh, in the Twin Cities here often it was land down by the river that would traditionally get flooded out a lot of times throughout the year. This is before we put in all of our kind of concrete infrastructure that's really minimized how much flooding we get. Um, but a lot of this would be land that was not considered valuable so no one would kick you off if you went and, and did some built your own little homes uh, in these areas. But like I said, unfortunately, they will get flooded out. <clears throat> uh, through time, as transportation options got better and better, uh, that uh, this chapter also uses the term suburban sprawl, which I'm sure you've all heard. Uh, but as transportation moved more and more out, uh, the, the density of the population in the suburbs got less and less, and that became and amenity for those suburbs. This is downtown Minneapolis, just going through some phases of growth. Uh, Fauché Tower, for a long time, the Fauché Tower was the tallest building in the state. Uh, people recognize the Fauché from Minneapolis, or is it too blocked by other big buildings now? Uh, well, the Fauché Tower, it was built, there was a big construction boom just before the Great Depression. Because uh, there is, well, it's a long story, but there was a lot of money flowing around for not great investments. That's part of the reason the Great Depression happened, is a lot of those investments sank. Uh, and the guy who built the Fauché Tower, he, he went out of business himself, but of course the Fauché Tower stayed around. Uh, you might notice, uh, normally buildings you can see are right on the corners of roads, but the Fauché, they had this whole little apron around it. That's because the, the city council thought that it was too tall of a building and it would eventually collapse. And so they wanted it to not be right on the road because when it did collapse, they hoped that it would just leave the, the rubble would just be in a confined space and it would only damage the property values of the property it was on. Um, but it would, it, it's, there are much taller buildings, right? Uh, it turned out we could, in fact, build buildings that tall with not a bunch of problems. Nicollet Avenue in 1924. Um, so our book talks a lot about Henry Ford and the Model T and about how this really uh, shot up uh, suburban sprawl and urban growth in the U.S. Um, the This is a, just a light signal, you know, and... They used to have a person who would operate it. Uh, if you travel, there's lots of countries that they still have people who are operating the actual turn signal signs. Uh, you may also notice the roads are, are dirt. It was a different city. Um, well, the invention of the Model T, uh, there's, a, there's a term and concept called Fordism, uh, which is big in geography. I'm not sure if it's brought up in this chapter, although Henry Ford has brought up a bunch. Um, what Fordism means is basically, Henry Ford said uh, that he wanted to pay his workers uh, a good salary, rather than just seeking the, the lowest salary, which was typically what employers did, was they were just like, what's the lowest I could hire people? He had a philosophy that he would hire uh, at a higher salary he felt that people who worked for him making cars should be able to make enough money that they would be able to buy a car. Um, and this is, if you ever hear of Fordism, 
that means that you have a middle class that are making enough money that they could fully participate in the economy, which stabilizes the economy because everyone is buying. And if everyone's buying something, then everyone is making something, right? If you get people to stop buying stuff, then all of a sudden there's no demand for making stuff. You lose your job making stuff. Uh, you can't buy stuff if you lost your job, and so it just gets worse and worse, right? Um, but this was a new mindset when it came to the industrial age and industrialization, the thought that a middle class was a thing. That was a new thought of like, oh, there would just, there'll be a middle class that, that um, would be living a standard that was, would be considered prosperous and wealthy uh, by other countries. Uh, like I said, that was a new concept, new, newish concept. Part of the reason he had to pay such higher wages is because it was a very different type of job than lots of jobs beforehand. Uh, it's a very r rigorous form of labor. Oh, quote from the book, Henry Ford freed common people from the limitations of geography. Um, so much true. You know, we had rail transport before. Uh, again, just some pictures from Minnesota of the car driving evolution. The other thing with the rise of the automobile was that all of a sudden everything was mobile and everything was connected to the automobile. Um, and so, uh, like mobile housing, trailer parks, uh, became a thing uh, because of the mobility of people. Um, as the suburbs kept on growing, the model for uh, what suburbs would be like were often found uh, at country clubs. Uh, these country clubs were often exclusive, but they would have things like a yard and trees and uh, and these are these are local country clubs, town and country club St. Paul. Uh, I should research and see if these are still active country clubs. But these were the, basically the model, even the, the architectural structure, you could kind of see uh, the suburban model in these. Um, and then again, the classic suburban sprawl. Well, uh, if everybody had a certain minimum size of a yard, uh, if we don't have dense density, and that became the point when people were wondering if we still would call suburbs cities or not, because cities typically part of their definition is higher density. Um, and if not, what would we call these? Uh, in general, people still lean toward calling a suburb a city because uh, suburbs have grown enough and they have now become a, an international phenomenon where uh, many places around the world have, have made the transition. In general, most places are not as sprawly as uh, in the United States. Uh, but, but plenty are getting that way, more are growing that way. Um, in the original suburbanization, they're very simple constructions to make them very, very cheap. Um, again, what, what else did the automobile do? Uh, well, people were moving out of the central cities, right? People were moving out of the central cities, especially when industrial jobs went away and so there wasn't a reason for you to live in the central city uh, if that's not the main source of employment. And if employment increasingly moving out to the suburbs, um, well then that's where people moved with it, right? And that caused a huge amount of, of disinvestment in the central cities, uh, places that were in the classically defined as uh, inner city areas, they had their tax base just going away, right? So money went down for everything from garbage collection to schools. And it's a reinforcing thing where money was going out of the central cities. And so people were like, well, I don't wanna live in a place that the money is going out, so I'm gonna move. And well, they would then take their money and income with them, right? Um, and so there was a real big decline as the rise of suburbs happened, there was a big decline in central cities. Uh, and central cities, as I said before, didn't really come back until the, the end of the Clinton years, they had a whole bunch of, um, they did things like, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the term uh, empowerment zone, um, 
or TIF financing. Um, TIF financing is tax increment financing. This is some financial juggling that cities in the US did to rebuild their cores. Uh, and what they did was they would, they would look at uh, like an empty lot of land downtown that is like derelict, abandoned, and just sitting there, not making the city any tax money, right? And the city would say, okay, hypothetically, if this area was fixed up and it was a nice new business, it would be earning this much in tax money to the city. So what if we loan a developer that amount that we'll be getting in the future to develop that area? We'll get that area developed and then they'll just pay us back later. Um, this, this policy often didn't end up working as far as the city getting that money back. It did work as far as getting developers into central cities because they were given free money. Uh, and so it's a thing that like, well, it didn't really work from a tax basis, but it worked in the way it needed to of getting kind of life and things back to downtowns. So lots of areas in central cities that used to be industrial uh, switched over to entertainment venues. Uh, condos were put up. I don't know if you remember there for a year, it seemed like condos were going in every single nook and cranny in the cities. Still are a bit. <clears throat> oh, but on the, on the topic of mobility of the U.S. and driving and how much it changed culturally, uh, you know, that's when the, the hotels switched to, to motor hotels or motels. Uh, drive throughs uh, became popular. Just anything that you would drive to. Um, like people have been to drive, drive in theaters, maybe movie theaters. I think there's still a couple in the state. That was, that was their heyday was when everyone was driving everywhere. <clears throat> All right. Um, central place theory, central place theory, uh, a big topic in geography. Central place theory was uh, a way to try to understand why different cities seem to have different sizes in relation to their distance from each other, right? I know that sounds a little complicated. Um, let's see if there's an easy way for me to explain this. <clears throat> Actually, maybe even the maps would be better. Um, so let's say that this is just a, a map of, of cities, all right? Let's just say, for example, uh, this might be Minneapolis, right? It's a big central city. Um, now, let's say you don't live in Minneapolis, right? You live out, let's say you live in Roseville, right? Um, well, Roseville actually has a lot of stuff going on. You could buy a lot of things. And so Roseville might be considered a second order place in that it's, it's further out from the central place, but there's plenty of shopping and plenty of jobs, uh, but it doesn't quite have the level of a downtown. And so, um, let's see what's an example of a product. Like, let's say that you wanna work in international banking. Right? Well, you're not gonna really get a job in Roseville. They're not gonna have international banking. Uh, Minneapolis, you know, look at the three tallest buildings we got downtown. Those are all international banking buildings. Like there's actually a great big international banking hub in Minneapolis. Uh, and so that would be one of the things that would make it so that this type of a city is larger than this type. Now, a, a city like Roseville, wouldn't naturally develop right next to a big city like this because people would just go to the big city instead, right? Uh, so it tends to be further out. So people who are living in a suburb, right? If they want to get most of their shopping, whatever job, uh, whatever thing they want to do in their day, they can find most of it here, which is relatively next to them. It's only some big things, right? So like, uh, I went and saw John Mulaney, the comedian, the other day, right? It's like, well, he's not going to be playing in Roseville, right? He was playing downtown St. Paul, because St. Paul is a much 
higher tier city, right? Well, Christaller was a German guy. <clears throat> he just noticed that this type of pattern happened in places that developed. You would have these different kind of categories of cities, um, and they would be at these certain set distances from each other. Um, and while well, he actually found looking at the U.S. was a real easy way uh, to kind of track these all these things out, uh, because in the U.S. the organization of our cities has been laid out just basically due to the rules of the market, right? Um, whereas in much of the rest of the world, there's lots of political reasons why cities are where they are. Uh, and why there are different cities in conjunction to them. There's, there's, there's resources and land and different things, uh, or places that just don't have good transportation. Whereas across the United States, using it as just a blank model, uh, our transportation was kind of pretty similar, kind of all over. Um, so it was easier to find, find these models. See, I think that's the simplest explanation for central place theory I could think of. All right, mobility. Um, mobility in cities, you know? A bunch of the stuff that we've already talked about, but when it comes to cities, whether they're growing or not, um, there's obviously natural population increases most cities, they're not growing because people are having lots of kids. That's not why most cities are growing. Uh, rural to urban migration, that's the reason most cities are growing, is because you have people moving to them. Uh, you know, and those people can have children sometimes, but uh, there's not a lot of people um, having kids. Um, also increasing urban to urban migration, I would say, that is another phenomenon that you'll see more in the U.S., um, more in places that have more of an uh, even geography, I guess I would say, where, um, you know, in the United States, the average person moves every three years. Uh, and so we're a very mobile society compared to much of the rest of the world where someone might live in the same house their entire lifetime, and that house might be handed down through generations, right? Uh, very different thing. Uh, there's some examples of kind of anti-urban sediment and anti-urban mindsets. I would say um, in the U.S. during uh, deindustrialization and when people were leaving central cities and, and uh, the inner city was losing resources, there was a contingent who became very anti-urban, would try to paint cities as these dangerous places. Um, and you know, it made interesting movies for people, it made interesting bad guys, like if you watch movies from the time frame and whatnot. Uh, China's another example of a big anti-urban uh, thing that happened, mostly because Many of the cities were seen as colonial legacy uh, and people who uh, had been educated in cities, they were seen as being educated by Europeans and by outside sources. Um, and so within China, there were times, time again, where uh, they, they told people to leave cities and move out into the rural areas because that's where the, the real real life blood of the country was, right? And you might have heard this, other countries say this too every now and then, they say, you know, you gotta go out and live in the rural areas because that's where the real people are. And it's like, well, there's real people everywhere, but okay. Um, but China reversed that after, uh, basically really after Mao died. Um, and today, you know, many of the main cities of the world uh, are located in China. <clears throat> um, and they still have uh, those colonial legacies. Um, 
you know, architecturally, you know, Shanghai here. Um, China itself, of course, was an empire, and as an empire, it started out from one central city and, and grew through space. Uh, and then China became a victim of uh, colonial powers and other countries coming in and taking parts here and there. And very, again, these were often city-based, right? So the Portuguese got Macau, for example, the British got Hong Kong. There were specific cities that these colonial powers went after to take and keep. Uh, Japan did too, uh, but there's not a lot left from the Japanese occupation of these different areas. Uh, culturally, the places that Japan took over during its big colonial era, uh, it's tough to describe. There was, lots of, there was lots of very bad feelings about the Japanese and the countries, when they kicked Japan out, they usually destroyed anything that Japan built because they considered it kind of a cultural contamination. Uh, modern day population map. As you can see, there's plenty of places that are quite populated that are not the global cities that are on the coast. <clears throat> so when it comes to cities, I think I've talked before about how China doesn't have those, the great big shanty towns that we'll see in, in most other developing countries, uh, including, you know, early Minnesota. Um, the main reason uh, is China has a lot of control over the migration of its populations. Um, there is migration to the cities, as you can see from these arrows here. These are some of the main areas. These are some of the main manufacturing districts. For, for global commodities. Um, but in China, if you want to move, even temporarily, you need specific permission uh, and you need documentation and correct passports. Uh, this is one of the reasons why, you know, China right now, it's in the news because of its uh, extremely rigorous COVID policies. Uh, it's so rigorous that Shanghai, um, well, there was one case of COVID and they shut down the city. They shut down the city to the extent that food wasn't coming in. And so people were actually going hungry. Uh, very, very strict controls of, of where people go. And what this has meant uh, to the urbanism is the urban the city uh, are very controlled environments. Uh, there are not populations that come in from rural areas that have to make their own housing. Uh, people just are not allowed to come in unless they have a full housing plan and a job and they're just all all set to go, right? Um, uh, Shanghai, just show you a couple of pictures from the, the streets of Shanghai, computer lab, went to. Uh, they're not great at respecting copyright trademarks in China. Uh, in many different areas, the old colonial architecture uh, is still in place. Uh, if it was not built by Japan, uh, then it's considered a cultural amenity. Uh, this is still Shanghai. As you can see, it's uh, bustling. Uh, this is a pedestrian-only zone. Most major cities of the rest of the world have lots of pedestrian-only zones that cars aren't all allowed, and that's only for walking. Uh, it's not something we've done in the U.S. that much because uh, we're such a car-focused place. <clears throat> oh, a little bit of Shanghai at night. Um, the, uh, the humidity is, is quite high in this region, uh, so you can go to soda machines that are in enclosed air-conditioned spaces so that you're kind of have an air conditioning timeout and have your cold beverage with uh, some cool air. Uh, Shanghai, a lot of the buildings kind of look like flying saucers. Oh, this picture is getting dark. Um, there was a lot of air pollution at the time, uh, but when I talk about the city being highly planned, uh, I was an urban planner for a number of years and I went here for a planning convention uh, and looked out their, their grand designs. 
everything is planned down to the minutest level and, and large overarching uh, nationally approved plans for these different buildings. Uh, and they are, well, they make gigantic structures and buildings just kind of uh, as part of their process. This is some more colonial buildings. The building on the left is supposed to, is supposed to be the, the British crown uh, on the top of this building. Like I said, colonial, colonial architecture. Um, this is another pedestrian only zone, but they did have these little, um, these little trolleys that would take you to McDonald's, but that's, you would have to want, go to, go to McDonald's if you wanted a free ride, so. Um, well, and that's plenty to give you for today. I'm gonna call today. We'll keep on this next time. And just remember Friday, no class, and Monday, our last lab.